The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the 82nd Mogcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, in conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg. If you can hear a hissing and crackling noise in the background, this is Jacob's smokeless coal fire. Jacob, good morning. Good morning, Paul. Thank you for coming around. Um, we are continuing our historical or recent historical exploration. Last time in the Mogcast, we did, as it were, the first half of Boris Johnson, ever topical subject. Um, and in this Mogcast, we're going to begin by talking about Boris Johnson and the economy. So looking at where we are now, I think the tax burden in 25-26 is forecast to be 35.1% of GDP. That'll be the highest since the early 70s. If you go back further, it's really only been substantially higher post-war um, during the great expansion of the state that followed. So the question that follows that is, how on earth has this happened? And who is responsible? How has it happened? Well, I think um, it's partly a consequence of where Gordon Brown left things, that he left a tax system that was going to increase its share of the uh, nation's wealth. And he took a final decision to put the top rate tax up to 50p, which um, was only ever reduced to 45p. I think it's happened because the Conservatives bought in quite some time ago to the idea that government spending is a good thing. And if you look at ministerial briefings before going on media rounds, uh, they always say, we have spent X billion pounds on whatever it is, as if the spending of money is in and of itself beneficial. So I think there has been a certain willingness of thinking about government expenditure and a need ultimately to pay for it. Uh, and that has led to too much government expenditure and too much taxation. So moving on, um, is it fair to say that um, somehow this was all Rishi Sunak's fault when he was Chancellor? We discussed last time and you've got an explanation for it, that at one point you, you referred to Rishi Sunak as a, as a socialist. Or how does one disentangle what he did as Chancellor and the fact that it was Boris Johnson who appointed him and it was Boris Johnson's premiership. That's that's a very important point. And um, as we move away from the immediate events of last summer, it's, it's possible to be more reflective. And I think the issue that you had is one that often occurs, actually, and that is a prime minister who wants to spend money and a chancellor who doesn't. And I think where this went wrong is that the deals that they did between them. The deal on social care was that it would be paid for by a national insurance rise. Now, what I was arguing at the time was not that it should be funded by a national insurance rise, but that as it was about 1% of government expenditure, it should be funded from cost savings uh, and not doing things. Uh, other people were saying, let's just borrow the money. I was never of that view. I thought you had to um, recognise that the amount the state was spending was already enough and work within that envelope and not actually increase tax and spending. Now, that argument didn't succeed, it wasn't accepted, um, and the Treasury orthodoxy required taxes to rise. I thought that was a mistake because of the consequences on economic growth. I think we are running at lower levels of growth than we could achieve because tax rates are simply too high. But that, I'm not in favour of endless deficit spending either. So you have to take the difficult decisions to reduce what the state does. And you were in a situation where the first and second lords of the Treasury did not agree on that. You just used the phrase Treasury orthodoxy. Just picking that up for a moment. 
the other side of treasury orthodoxy not precisely be that you cut spending as an alternative to raising taxes? Well, I don't know why they weren't proposing that. And that may be part of the Brown legacy, that the Treasury, through spending, had got control of the work of almost all departments to the finest detail that departments have, um, or did have, Quasi was trying to change this, but did have, and I obviously don't know what's happening now, very little ability to change funding between budgets. So if they had a project that they thought wasn't any good, they didn't have the discretion to say, well, we'll cut this project and put the money here. Once the Treasury had approved the spending in a specific field, it had to carry on there. Now, as I said, Quasi was trying to change that, um, but I don't know where it will have ended up now. You're suggesting that the Treasury itself may have lost its appetite for spending control. I think the Treasury sees its control of Whitehall via the control of spending, and therefore it doesn't want to lessen its control, which would follow if it lessens spending. So getting back to Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson, is what happened in effect that Boris Johnson said, we need these spending rises. And Rishi Sunak said, well, we can't borrow the money from them. We're going to have to put up taxes, perhaps thinking that Boris Johnson would say, well, we can't do that. But Boris Johnson said, right, if that's the deal, that's what we have to do. That may well be right, yes. Because... Um, when I was calling for cutting expenditure, th this seemed to be something that neither side was particularly thinking about or interested in. Uh, um, uh, and Boris did suggest to me that I could work out how to make a saving in um, my own area of responsibility, which at the time I was leader of the House. And I said, well, we would just scrap uh, the ridiculous proposal to move out of the House of Parliament for 10 to 15 billion pounds, and that's quite a big saving. Um, is he saying, in effect, well, look, I don't know about anyone else. I'm not going to ask anyone else. But look, Jacob, if you really think there are savings to be found, you can find them in your own department. No, he, he, he was saying, um, if there are these savings, if you can find them in your department, well, then we can look at ah. um, everywhere else. And for me, it was easy because um, the, the um, restoration and renewal project at that point was spiralling out of control. So it happened in any event. Well, you, made this, you made the saving, but other people did not. This has fundamentally been changed, um, but it's a very long-term project. Uh, and the House of Commons needs restoration and renewal. It just doesn't need the scheme that they came up with, which I think would have moved people out for 20 years and cost 10 to 15 billion pounds. Do you think it's fair to say, um, I mean, I've often written this in one form or another, so you can tip me off if you think I'm wrong, that Boris Johnson somehow sees economics as a sort of form of light entertainment or a Roman circus. You cut spending, you borrow money, you build statues, you build bridges, you entertain the crowd. But the, he's curiously short of the old orthodox conservative instinct to control spending. I, I, I wouldn't look at it quite like that, perhaps not surprisingly. But every politician has areas of focus and deep interest and, and knowledge, which is what they want to do whilst they're in politics. And other areas they delegate. Um, so um, Tony Blair wasn't particularly focused on the economic policy of his government. He was interested in other areas. I think that was true of Boris as well. Boris wanted to deal with levelling up. He wanted to make sure that the benefits of Brexit were spread across the whole country. He wanted to deliver Brexit. Um, but was he thinking, um, what, what, what was Ed Ball's phrase about neo-endogenous growth theory? Neo-endogenous growth theory. I don't think those were the sorts of words that would have come out of Boris's mouth except to mock the person who had said them in the first place because he thought it sounded unduly highfalutin. Um, and, and that is a reflection of personality and is true to a greater or lesser extent in all leaders. So Margaret Thatcher was absolutely fascinated by the economy and that was her driving motivation. Um, other successful prime ministers, Disraeli comes to mind, uh, had no real interest in, in, in economic activity. They give you the figures someone is meant to have said to Disraeli before his 
before you first become a chancellor. budget, if yes. I remember rightly. Yes. Which wasn't a success. Which wasn't a success, no. And, and I don't think anyone would have suggested that Boris would be a chancellor of the Exchequer. You know, you, you know that was never something that people said, oh, he's the obvious choice for that. There are two ways of looking at this. Um, one way would be to ask how on earth it is that Boris Johnson has succeeded in maintaining, broadly speaking, the affection of the right of the party, which is you know, still up to a point, I suppose, his base and which broadly delivered him the leadership or at least the impetus behind his leadership campaign. Because on immigration, he's sort of basically a liberal. He's not really got much instinct for controlling public spending. Um, he is essentially rather mayoral in his attitude to things. Having been a mayor, it's a bit of this here, it's a bit of that there. He's really rather, rather eclectic. And by instinct, he's not a, goodness knows, it's not a phrase that's in fashion now, but it is indicative of a certain attitude of mind. He's not a sort of hanger and flogger. How no. has he done it? Well, he delivered Brexit. And he ran London well and cheaply. So running London, he did not cost anything like as much as Sadiq Khan does. And he didn't pillory the motorist and so on and so forth. So he showed himself to be at heart somebody on the side of the individual against big government. And I think that's very important. Is this and some... he showed that, sorry to interrupt, but he showed that in the pandemic as well, when he always wanted to release us and give us back our freedoms, even if the very strong... Uh, expert advice was to the contrary. To, to be fair to um, all concerned, which we always try to be, um, when discussing public spending, one can't fail to take into account the effects of the, the pandemic. Just moving on to Boris Johnson, there might be another explanation why um, much of the Conservative Party has been so relaxed about his attitude to public spending, which is the Conservative Party itself has stopped worrying about it in the same way that it did. And let me illustrate this by returning to something we've discussed before. Um, I was very struck during the summer, during the Conservative leadership election, feels like a long time ago, actually, it's quite recently, by how neither Rishi Sunak nor Liz Truss wanted to say very much about the control of spending. Indeed, Liz Truss, I think, specifically said, we I don't have any plans to scale back public spending. And I thought at the time, do you remember writing at the time in the Daily Telegraph, how peculiar this was? Because very clearly, you couldn't substantially cut taxes. It's also substantially cut spending on the Thatcher model. What's going on in the minds of some people on the right? Because I already noticed like the first shy late winter flowers bursting their way through the ground. Voices are beginning to raise again and say, well, we need tax cuts. And Liz Truss was right. It wasn't explained properly. The point isn't that we don't need tax cuts. We obviously do. But we also need substantial spending restraint. And no one at the top of politics seems to want to talk about it. No, well, I think it's a very important thing to talk about. Uh, we, we have a spiralling welfare budget. Um, the figures today, what were they showing? That um, top 10% of taxpayers provide 53% of income tax, and more than half the country receive more from the state than they pay in. This isn't ultimately sustainable, um, that, that the tax rate becomes too high. We've seen um, a very large number, again, it was reported recently, of uh, non-doms leave and take their money with them. People with over a million pounds have left because the tax rates are, are too high. And then you lose money, uh, you weaken the economy, you have less money for public services. And we have expensive public services that aren't working properly. And I'm really interested that where Streeting, obviously a Labour politician, is talking about reform in the NHS, which the Conservatives have shied away from. But that is something we are going to have to talk about because uh, the NHS is not working as it should. Um, uh, and... It, we cannot endlessly go on spending more money and thinking that there's somebody else who will pay for it. How much of the political problem is that I think roughly a third of public spending goes on welfare and pensions, so I say health and pensions, um, health and pensions largely consumed by older voters, older voters largely vote Conservative, 
not in the Conservative Party's electoral interest to tackle this problem. This is becoming an increasing difficulty for the country as a whole. Well, I think the problem with health at the moment is that we're spending a lot of money on it but not getting the results that we need. And it's fascinating speaking to people working in the health service about how they think the money could be spent more effectively. Uh, and um, when I was speaking to a, a professor of emergency care who was explaining to me that if you can look after people better in the nursing homes that they're in, so that they don't come to A&E, you then um, reduce the pressure on A&E, reduce the pressure on ambulances, and they're going in for things that are eminently treatable within the nursing home setting. But the nursing home's default is to ring 999 and get them taken into hospital, which they then stay in for much too long because discharge hasn't been working very well. So there are things that aren't enormously costly um, that you can do that save costs at the, at the other end. And it's trying to get a proper reform. And how do you do this? How, how do you move from um, a health service that is governed by the producer interest? There's a link here. Um between um, a suppressed appetite for reform and Boris Johnson's 2019 manifesto. Now, in some respects, um, I think there were radical policies in the manifesto, for example, on housing, which the government's found itself unable to deliver, uh, partly because of conservative backbench resistance. I think it's fair to say on education and health, there really wasn't very much reform in the manifesto, was there? In education, there was a plan to continue with what had already been done, which is, is I think, a good broad policy. Um, housing, it's such a pity that this dreadful algorithm got brought into housing because it was the algorithm that stopped the reform in its tracks. And then by the time reform was coming back, the whole political impetus had gone. I, I think that is the big missed opportunity of this parliament. I thought it was fundamental economically, fundamental for the chances uh, of young people getting on the housing ladder, fundamental actually for the Conservatives' long-term electoral prospects. And as I say, by the time it came round, it was lacking in political impetus and political support. And the, the NIMBY tendency within the Tory party managed to um, neuter it. And on health? On health in 2019, we were still in the position of saying um, broadly, I paraphrase, people are nervous about the Tories' approach to the health service. Uh, we must therefore outspend Labour because otherwise this is a big political problem. We were carrying on with the Cameron approach to health, which electorally had proved very successful. What changed it was the pandemic because the pandemic showed up um, uh, both great strengths in the health service, but also some of the weaknesses and the recovery from the pandemic has heightened the need for reform. So 2019 was a missed opportunity or... Not on was... health, it wasn't. I don't think anyone would have listened to us on health reform in 2019. I don't, you have to do things when the political appetite is there. That's why I keep on banging on about poor old West Streeting. But what he's saying is so important because I think that reflects the political appetite for reform and the Tories therefore need to be thinking about it very seriously. It's a shame, isn't it, that if you are a senior politician, like uh, yourself or Sajid Javid, who wrote a whole long article in the yeah. Times about it this weekend about health service reform, you can only say this when you're no longer in office. Um, yes and no, uh, that I think that this is one of those things that has genuinely changed. Um, I mean, on, on what we've been discussing on housing, I was pushing that when I was in office, uh, um, um, encouraging it. I, I issued a paper on it just before I got in, which I could point back to if anybody asked me my views without abandoning collective responsibility. So there are some things you can push, but some things you have to wait for the time to be right. And I think the time uh, now, now is right. And I, I think we should encourage... Um, people to use private health. I mean, I, I don't understand the uh, nervousness about um, using private health, which makes the cues for public health lower. To agree with your colleague, James Cartledge, I think he's now a minister uh, on that point, who wrote for us a piece about tax breaks for private care. James essentially argued, well, the argument 
traditionally has been you can't propose seats because they're electorally unpopular. But that may change, James argued, as a greater number of people pay for private care. As a general rule, I'm in favour of low tax rates and very few breaks. I, I think there is a very good argument to be made for saying that companies should be able to provide health care for their employees on a tax deductible basis rather than it being fully taxed and national insurance um, subject to. And just finally, um, finishing off on uh, Boris Johnson, um, do you think it's unlikely that there will be a leadership election this year that will return him? As it's obviously a subject of fascination to some Conservative MPs and my journalistic colleagues. I've written on the whole, I think it's unlikely. I think it's think? unlikely. I, I, but not impossible. Well, after what happened last year, I think suggesting things are impossible wouldn't be very wise. But it, it, I am um, one of Boris's flabellifers that uh, I could not be more supportive of him um, and thought it was a mistake to get rid of him. But the Tory party does not want to change leader again between now and election. It, it would make us look completely scatty if we were to do so. Um, it is very hard to remove a sitting prime minister, and I know two removed last year, but it is still difficult to do. Um, th that it is in the interests of the party and people like me to back the leader, um, regardless of whether we're tasting the king over the water privately uh, at dinner we need to support the leader who is in place in the interest of the party and the country. And I think plotting for another leadership contest is a mistake, an error of judgment. If you toast the king over the water at dinner, that surely means you want the king back. Well, I, I think you'd find a lot of people were toasting the Jacobites as a romantic ideal long after they could actually tell you who the Jacobite claimant really was. And do you think... Um... Do you think there's a conspiracy against Boris Johnson? And a journalistic friend of mine was saying yesterday that he's he's like an earworm. He said, everywhere you go, it's it's Boris Johnson. Will he come back? There's a story about him suggesting that the BBC chairman was involved in fundraising for him. You turn the television on, he's there in Ukraine. He's everywhere, just as Thatcher was in the 80s. It is absolutely true. Boris Johnson is much the biggest political figure in the UK political firmament. And that's been true for some time. And the fact that he's no longer prime minister doesn't change it. Uh, that that um, he is, he has an extraordinary charisma, which is very rare in politics. And people are interested in him and he does interesting things. Is there a, finally, is there a, conspiracy to do him down, because I can't help noting these stories about um, uh, his uh, potential Boris Johnson comeback. As you read more and more of them, somehow other stories appear to um, um, somehow come into public circulation about various alleged misdeeds. Boris infuriates dull people. So dull people get frightfully upset that somebody who's much more interesting than them, cleverer than them, uh, has been so much more successful when they're worthy and decent and dull. And um, anyone listening to this who uh, wants to make up disagreeable stories about Boris should remember in their heart of hearts that this means they're fundamentally dull. Is it fair to say dull people are, are irritated by Boris Johnson when some people may be very angry with him over the COVID parties? Well, I think they are. They haven't looked at the details of the parties. That the, the, um, Boris did not have COVID parties. We will end the podcast there um, this week because otherwise we will go on and on over time. Uh, and regretfully, we will wave farewell to Boris Johnson and return next time to um, consider the still very lively issue of Brexit. Uh, what happened? Did it go well? Should it be going better? All that for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Mogcast 
a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.